an awesome performance. Hello and welcome to Talk Vietnam. You've just seen Jeremy Donovan playing the didgeridoo, which is a wind instrument made by the indigenous Australians of northern Australia nearly 10,000 years ago. Now, uh, Jeremy is known the world over as one of Australia's finest Aboriginal artists, and he's happened to be in Hanoi t uh, this time for as part of a performance uh, for Australia's gift to Hanoi on its 1,000th birthday. It's our honor to have him here in our studio today, so please join me in welcoming him. Thank you very much, Jeremy, for coming onto the show to our studio today. Um, I'm a bit curious because we just saw a performance of you. What are the meanings of the stripes on your body? Uh, for us, when we are performing in our traditional ceremony, we paint our body with uh, ochre, which is a natural clay. Mm -hmm. And what happens is, before we have ceremony, we often we go down to the creek, to the river, uh, where we know the ochre is, where we know the clay is, and we, we sing songs to the, to the earth, to the mother, about, can we take some of your blood? And so then we dive down underneath the water, and we dig the clay up, and then we carry it out. And so then, no matter where we are in the world, we are always carrying uh, what is perceived to be the blood of the mother. And so when we put it onto our skin, we then ask the mother, we are now going to put your blood all over our body. And so when we're in ceremony, can you pull us into your womb and to hold us so we can have the comfort of the healing from the, from the mother, from the earth? Because she is our greatest uh, um, reason for all of our ceremonial practice. We, Everything we do is about reminding the mother how much we admire her for what she has given us in this life. And so the spots that were all over my body represent the rain that falls on our body in the rainforest in far northern Queensland. Using the clay as uh, the painting on your body, it's also another symbol of you and Mother Earth being one being during one. the ceremony. Definitely. Great. So we saw that you were playing the didgeridoo, yeah. as we said from the beginning. Can you tell us a little bit about the cultural background of this instrument? The didgeridoo is perceived or, or known around the world as one of the world's <coughs> oldest living wind instruments. For the northern Aboriginal people of Australia, it's been played uh, for an estimated you know, 10,000 years, you know, give or take 2,000 here or there. And it's an instrument that where my family from is not known as the didgeridoo. Didgeridoo, in fact, is, was a word that was introduced with the European settlement. In my language, this instrument is known as the yigi yigi. Mm -hmm. And yigi yigi translates to, to blow the breath of the mother. So it's about bringing the life, the breath of the mother, so we can hear her speak to us when we're in ceremony. And it was used in ceremony uh, for you know, leading the dancers, communicating to the dancers through ceremony, and then, as well as the traditional healing, the mapa nyuporo, which is the background that I come from in using it for the medicine. For us, you know, the didgeridoo was always spoken about. It was like a wooden book. Mm -hmm. It was just a device for us to tell a story. Great. Yeah. Now we know as part of your program uh, this time in Hanoi, you've uh, played didgeridoo with a Vietnamese bamboo flute player. Do you see any kind of differences or similarities between these two instruments? Yes, yeah, so certainly I, I was very fortunate to meet uh, a lovely man who is, a, I guess, a, a flute expert, you know, of the Vietnamese flutes and many of the Vietnamese uh, instruments. In playing the didgeridoo with him, uh, I was also given the opportunity to play our native flutes with him. And in the native flutes that we have, there were striking similarities in the mm -hmm. sounds that we were mimicking stories of, of the land and mimicking the sounds of the natural world and, and wildlife. And the way we played the flute is, you know, to play with your heart. And so when he was playing this instrument, the minority flute, and playing from his heart, and I was playing with my heart, it was definitely amazing similarities in that. Right. So I, I know you have the flute here with you. Can you show us a little bit about how it's sim similar to the didgeridoo? Thank <laughs> you. 
much. Now we also actually have a clip of Jeremy playing with the Vietnamese bamboo flute player. So let's take a look at that. Cảm giác thì là nó rất là lạ tại vì là à, bình thường thì khi mà cái âm nhạc tất cả các nhạc cụ thì hầu như đều có các nốt do re mi san san la si lô thế nhưng mà với cái đi ray đu này thì là nó 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 không có những cái như thế mà nó tạo ra một cái âm thanh không phải là nhịp điệu bài hát nhưng mà nó lại tạo ra cái cảm giác rất là hoang dã giống như kiểu âm thanh của rừng rồi của chim muông rồi thì cùng con vật ở trong rừng nhá đây là cũng là lần đầu tiên em được tiếp cận với cái, cái âm nhạc là đi đi đu thì em thấy là rất là lạ so với những người Việt Nam à, khi cái âm nhạc của đi đi đu nổi lên thì gần như là em thấy nó rất là hào hứng mà em đặc biệt ấn tượng nhất mới là cách lấy hơi của người uh, Australia người ta vừa có thể giữ được hơi mà người ta vừa có thể tạo ra cái âm thanh bằng chính cái hơi mà họ giữ trong 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 miệng đấy ạ. anh ấy có cái kỹ thuật chơi là anh ấy truyền hơi rất là là giỏi mà trong cái nghiệp chơi sáo cũng như là cái hệ hơi thì cũng cần phải phát huy cái 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 việc mà tự tiếp hơi tất nhiên ở Việt Nam có nhiều người cũng, cũng có một số người cũng có thể làm được cái việc mà tiếp hơi truyền hơi một cách coi như là cái người nghe không biết là lấy hơi vào lúc nào There's no need to be able to speak each other's language because once you play this music, it will the language is already there in the music and so I think it was great for people to see that you, you don't even need music to be written that we can sit down and if we are playing the song from our heart, then the song will dance together. You mentioned playing the didgeridoo as a way to connect with Mother Earth, as a way to kind of voice her voice. Um, so what kind of stories can you tell through your playing didgeridoo? For us, we can tell uh, stories of sorrow, um, stories of sadness. We can tell stories of great celebration. We can tell stories about the seasons changing. We have songs about the way the moon moves in the sky through the night. We have many stories about the stars. Uh, we then have the, all the animal sounds. We then have sounds for communicating with our family. So there are so many different varieties of sounds that we can play depending on what the ceremony, what the ritual was actually about. Or we can simply just play a, a beat like uh, with modern music and just follow a tempo that, you know, with modern music has. I know you've performed the world over with your didgeridoo. Can you kind of recall some of your landmark performances? There's been so many, and it's not the uh, the big ones that actually stick, you know, in my mind. It's you know, I've been so so fortunate that you know I've had the chance to perform with some of the biggest musicians in the world. You know, I've performed with uh, System of a Down. I've performed with Neil Diamond. I've performed with George Thorogood and many of those over in the United States. But it's, to me, it's, you know, I've been fortunate enough to go to like very small um, indigenous communities um, in the Americas, um, in Canada, um, in Sweden, where I'm playing with people that are indigenous to their land mm -hmm. and sitting around with them and watching them hear the sound of the didgeridoo and seeing the expression on their face where you can see that the sound is truly touching their heart. They're the ones that you know stick with me the most. Um, you know, offhand, there are so many to recall, but probably one of the most beautiful ones was when I first went to a Navajo American Indian reservation, and I played the didgeridoo, and the people there had never heard this sound before, and there was a very beautiful old lady. Um, she must have been in her 90s, and she she walked out, and she had 
uh, tears running down her face and she said the sound the sound that she heard was sounds that touched her heart that made her heart cry and for me this was this was incredible I mean she's the lady that gave me the necklace that I wear today and I take this everywhere I go yeah so on his Hanoi visit this time, Jeremy had a talk with the teachers and also students of the National University for Arts Education. So we'll take a look at that now. Right from the first moments he played the Dick Ridu, he won the hearts of the audience. He further enchanted the students with his circular rhythm a vital degree playing technique. Through his performance and speech, Jeremy succeeded in promoting the quintessence of his culture, the Vietnamese youngsters. Hôm nay anh uh, Jimmy uh, đã biểu diễn rất là thành công nhạc cụ uh, cổ truyền của mình. Em cảm thấy rất thích thú. Uh, thông qua cái buổi ngày hôm nay thì em uh, được biết thêm những uh, nét bản hóa, bản bản sắc uh, dân tộc của đất nước Australia. Và nhất là cái nhạc cụ vừa rồi thì uh, đã làm cho em đã hiểu biết thêm uh, rất là một cái nhạc cụ rất là đặc sắc và uh, cũng như những bức vẽ rất là rất là đặc biệt và cũng rất là rất là đẹp. Thì em có một cái điều rất là ấn tượng đó là nhạc cụ này rất là độc đáo về về cả cái 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 hình dáng, về cả cái nói chung là độc đáo về tất cả những gì nó bao mang tính nghệ thuật và mang tính văn hóa ở ở về của người thổ dân Úc. Perhaps the most joyful part of the exchange between Jeremy and the students was when he taught them how to mimic some wildlife. Bouncing like a kangaroo was great fun. Jeremy has so far performed and had similar exchanges with youngsters around the world, from the US, Canada, to the UK, Germany, Switzerland and Italy, among others. So tell us about your own didgeridoo. Is it a special made one? Yeah, the didgeridoo that I've been using tonight and the whole time that I'm out here in Hanoi is probably one of one of the favorites of my collection. I have about uh, five performing didgeridoos that I use for performing. And it's it's just a beautiful instrument that really holds the sound and allows me to play both a mixture of the traditional style and the contemporary style. We talked about the didgeridoo the whole time, but let's now take a look at it. What is it made of? Uh, the didgeridoo is um, its a really basic instrument, uh, given that it was designed 10,000 years ago. The didgeridoo itself is just a young, hollow eucalyptus tree that the termites have eaten the core out of. Mm -hmm. So when we make didgeridoos, we go into the bush, we look for the young sapling trees that the termites have eaten out of, we chop the tree down, we crush the termite nest from the middle, so we're left with a hollow log. Then we take all the bark back, so we're left with just the hard surface wood. And then we apply beeswax to the top, to the beeswax. mouth. And the, it's just there to make it softer on our lips when we are playing, because some of our traditional songs could have over 800 individual verses wow. and go for over four hours without a pause. So you need to have something soft there on your lips when you're playing. Mm -hmm. Oh, oh, oh. 
talked about your uh, Aboriginal um, origin. Can you tell us a little bit about your family background? Okay, so um, I, I've had a, a pretty interesting, you know, upbringing, pretty interesting, you know, background. I was born up in northern Queensland, and then at, at a couple of days old, I was removed from my family, and I was raised in a Polynesian family with, uh, with foster parents, with a Maori father and a Samoan mother. And so I grew up with a total Pacific Island background as a young person growing up. And it wasn't until I was 16 that I was given the chance to meet my biological parents for the first time. And my mother, my biological mother, is an Anglo-Australian lady, a white lady. And my father is an Aboriginal man from far northern Queensland. And it was my father's parents, my grandparents, that really are the ones that at 16 came into my life mm -hmm. and started teaching me all about my culture and, and ultimately teaching about me about who I am from the inside out. So it was kind of a turning point for you when you first kind of gotten into touch with uh, your Aboriginal culture. Yeah, when I met my grandfather and grandmother for the first time, it really shifted my life because for the first time in my life, obviously being displaced, mm -hmm. I knew who I was. And so it really was a huge turning point in my life. Were they the ones who taught you how to play the didgeridoo? Yeah, Grandad was definitely the one who... He's pretty much the one that's responsible for most of my teachings. He taught me to speak my traditional language. He taught me to sing the traditional songs. He taught me to dance the dances. He taught me the artwork. Mm -hmm. And he taught me, you know, the didgeridoo. Would you say that he's someone who has been a really strong influence on your life? Made uh, who you are, who you my are grandfather today? Is not probably, but is most definitely uh, the, uh, the most important person that ever came into my life. Yeah. How has he changed your life? Has well, he seen it? You know, for me, when I, when I met my granddad, I was pretty much down and out in society. I was, you know, really struggling with an identity, struggling with, with life, um, trying to understand the concept of why I was put here. And my grandfather, in spending that time out in the land, out in the bush with my grandfather, he really taught me about understanding the land, about understanding that that land is so much about who I am. And he taught me about stillness, about sitting in the quietness. Um, he taught me about sitting in your own shadows, not being afraid of your shadows, of, of your past. And so just all of his wisdom that he had just has had such a major effect on my life and also is, you know, I know the world that my grandfather grew up in. He grew up in a world where being Aboriginal in Australia was not so easy. And so, I, for me, when I travel the world, I feel blessed that I've been given this chance to be the voice that he was never given the chance to be. <laughs> about how long you've been playing the didgeridoo and we've talked about how your um, granddaddy has been a big part of that but uh, did you start playing when you were 16? No, I started playing didgeridoo when I was about 18 years old. Um, my grandfather never let me play didgeridoo until I could speak the language first because mm -hmm. in order to play traditionally, like I mentioned, you must be able to speak the language and so, you know, my grandfather taught me to sing all the songs first and then I was given the chance to learn to play didgeridoo and I was never really that interested in playing didgeridoo. I much preferred performing in the traditional dance. But fortunately, or unfortunately, however you look at it from which side, was I became a good didgeridoo player. And so no one you know, wanted me to do anything but play didgeridoo. And so I became sort of a leading didgeridoo player for the community, for my people. And so, 
you know, and then it just stuck. And it, 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 for me, I resurrected my life a lot, you know, with playing the didgeridoo because it allowed it allowed me to express a lot of the pain that I had inside. Right. How long did it take for you to master it? Uh, I don't think I've mastered it yet. You know, like there's still things that, you know, I listened to the old tapes of my grandfather playing, mm -hmm. and while it was so raw and so pure. I, I'm still in, in amazement at some of the things that he was doing through that instrument. And so, and I don't believe we ever master anything. I think we're always walking towards perfection, but we were born in this place with imperfections. Um, so what is the most difficult technique for you when you're playing, you know, the basic, most basic technique you yeah. need when you're playing the didgeridoo? I guess the fundamental basic is that if you cannot circular breathe, you cannot play didgeridoo effectively because circular breathing is what allows us to play in a continual process without pausing and it's an ability to breathe through the nose and blow out the mouth at exactly the same time. Okay. So air is going out, in, at the same time. So it's going to sound like this going. Wow. <laughs> so when I'm playing didgeridoo, like if Without the didgeridoo, this is exactly what I'm doing. And that's cor correct me if I'm wrong, but the air goes through here and then out he here. Yeah, so basically the air goes down in the nose. The nose. And it goes down into this part of the body, and then our diaphragm, our stomach, right. s contracts and pushes the air back up, which forces the, the air out. Um, so, can, do you mind showing us more of these techniques, especially with the animal sounds? I know it's very interesting. So, yeah. do you mind giving us a demo? No problem. So, when we play uh, didgeridoo, we are uh, mimicking the sounds of our native wildlife, the animals. We have rhythms for the land. Uh, so I'm just going to go through some of the animal sounds. The first one, one of our most famous uh, animals, the kangaroo, in its bouncing. Make this sound, it's just our lips vibrating and our tongue just saying dill, 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 dill. The next sound is the dingo, which is one of our native dogs, which initially uh, was brought across uh, from Southeast Asia uh, about, I believe it was about 15,000 years ago but has become a big part of indigenous culture and also Australia's natural wildlife. This is the dingo howling. This sound is just my voice. The next sound, one of our most famous uh, birds or animals in Australia is our laughing kingfisher, something called the kookaburra. And it's very famous around the world because it's such a small bird, but it has this very extraordinary laugh. And its laugh sounds something like this. Many different sounds that we can play, but what I'm going to show you is just how we can put those sounds together to create a story. 
This story is about the kookaburra laughing at the crocodile that's swimming in the water. the didgeridoo what are some of your other lifetime passions you may call uh, I have so many lifetime passions and I'm always forever finding new lifetime passions as well um, for me my artwork is is definitely a lifetime passion and artwork for me has been in my life far longer than the didgeridoo as well mm -hmm. um, artwork was a way that I found uh, as a tool to express myself as a young person when I was uh, down and out when I was getting into a lot of trouble. Artwork was seemingly the only thing that I ever had the ability to express myself with. Um, I was completely illiterate, so I, I couldn't, couldn't uh, read or write. And so, but creating artwork in, in areas that I probably shouldn't have been creating artwork was something that I, that I had a true love for. So this artwork that you've been talking about, this is the Aboriginal dot paintings. Yeah, the dot not? paintings. Can you show us a little bit about um, these artworks? So the, the first painting here that, that I have, it's, you know, it looks like such a, a simple painting in a sense that it's just a black canvas with thousands of white dots. But to us, this story here is such a, a sacred story. It's, this story here is all about the stars, all about the Milky Way. It's all about the fact that um, our ancestors, when, they pass, when our people pass away, that they go to the stars, to be in the stars. So every night when the stars come out, we can walk outside no matter where we are in the world and we can look up and know that our ancestors are there watching over us. So we never have a feeling of ever being alone because we always have that connection to our ancestors. And the Milky Way um, is, a, is such a strong symbol in the sky, especially in Australia, to the indigenous mm -hmm. and to the non-indigenous people. Um, th the next two paintings that I'll show you are, are a series that belong to both to both the men and women alike. Mm -hmm. um, but this story here is all about, it's, it's all about the water hole, the sacred water hole, the Wudja Wollongale, which in our language means the water that washes our body. And this story here is about the women's part. And this is about where the women go. This part here is a part that only the women can go to. Um, and when they wash off, it's only for the women. And this, pl this place here is like a beautiful sacred waterhole. And all of our artwork generally is as if you're looking down upon it. So you have here, you have the waterhole, the big large pool, and then the different streams, the little rivers that run off it. And then the colors are just symbolic of the beautiful blue, rich water that we have up there in the rainforest. And the next, is that, is that the next one is where it just continues on and it joins and it becomes, in, in the two pictures, becomes the male and female waterfall where the men and women come together then to cleanse after ceremony and then they are, you know everything is, their body is clean and their body is pure and after they get out of the water then we use smoke mm -hmm. uh, from the eucalyptus leaves right. to cleanse our body because our people believe that the cleanest your skin can ever be is when you have the smoke of the eucalyptus blow all over you right oh, it's beautiful i just have a uh kind of curiosity about how the dots are created. Do you use a paintbrush or is there a certain um, Each individual object? dot is, is all done by hand. It's all done by hand. And I use a, um, a stick which is quite similar to like a chopstick. You know, the, the same sort of, uh, you know, width. Mm -hmm. And I just would sit there 
and individually, you know, dot in the paint and then just push down very lightly just to create the dots. Mm. And, it's, and then it just allows the painting to weave itself. So tell me about, about your painting career. How, how far have you gone? Um, again, you know, I'm always, you know, seeking the next level in my artwork. Um, in 2005, I was given the opportunity to have my first ever solo art exhibition. Mm -hmm. And I had 32 paintings um, on exhibition in Sydney and Darling Harbour. And on the first night, all 32 paintings sold out. Wow. Um, at that art gallery that that was at, it was the first time that they'd ever had an art artist exhibit and sell out on the first day. Um, it was a, a deeply humbling experience. For me, I was having a hard time with the with the idea that people just came and bought all of my paintings because for so long I'd given them away to friends and to family or mm -hmm. I'd never painted as maybe a means of being able to support myself or support my family. And One of the greatest pieces of news that I've been fortunate enough to receive is in my invitation to come to Hanoi mm -hmm. um, to, to share this exchange for the celebration for the Happy Birthday Hanoi um, gift from Australian Embassy is that I was contacted by the lady who's been in charge of creating the mosaic, um, mm. the, the large six kilometer wall. Right. And in her seeing my art, she has taken some of my artwork and is gonna create a mosaic of my artwork that will live in Hanoi forever. Wow. So there's a little bit of Jeremy that's gonna live in <laughs> Hanoi for the rest of my life, which for me that, you know, is, is one of my greatest you know, artistic achievements. Great. Um, so also as part of his cultural exchange in Hanoi this time, Jeremy taught a group of children how to dot paint. So let's have a look at that. của chú rất là tròn, rất là tròn, tạo thành một cái hình rất là đẹp. These days, uh, when we're painting, we we use acrylic paint, but um, traditionally we we use this ochre, which is the clay, and in the clay it has a um, a natural oxide which is why it stayed on the rock walls for so long like when my family are from we have rock paintings that are 40,000 years old that are, have not disappeared because the clay is last forever in there Dot painting quite known in Australia, or is it just starting? Also well, to Aboriginal art, the dot painting, is probably the most successful trade that's ever come out of the Aboriginal culture. And you know, there are Aboriginal artists that are no longer with us that have passed away. That their artwork is selling in New York for you know 1.2 million U.S. Wow. dollars, uh, two million U.S. dollars for a Rover Thomas painting. I mean, it's quite incredible the amount of money that some of the Aboriginal artworks fetching. The the sad part is is the indigenous people were not paid that much money when they were bought 
you know, they might have been paid a couple of hundred dollars and now it's just gone up in collection uh, price. And so it's only now that people are starting to appreciate the, the price of, of this artwork and actually appreciate paying the indigenous people the, 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 the right price for the painting as well. You also offer traditional healing sessions to the public. Yeah. Can you tell us a little bit about this? What happens is using language, using our spoken language, using our sweat, using the ochre, the clay, right. on someone's body, and then using the vibration of the didgeridoo on the body is a, a very powerful healing tool because the didgeridoo, our bodies are 90% water. So sound travels through water eight times faster than it does through air. So making it, if our bodies, if our cells are made from water, when this sound goes into the body, they vibrate, causing them to expand. So if we have cellular memory or if we have cellular damage, then it forces this to expand where the memory can be brought up or if we have illness that's attached to those cells, it can force them to, you know, to release. And so wow. while I never prophesize to, to heal the world, that I don't believe that I can heal anything, but I believe that I can give you a tool that then you can heal yourself with. How have the people that you've healed um, responded to you? Um, the people that I've worked with, um, some of them I have come back you know, every week when I'm at mm -hmm. home in Australia. I've had, and again, like I don't profess to heal anyone, you know, that I had a, a beautiful family from Los Angeles in America um, contact me and they flew me out to Los Angeles to work with their, their husband, their father, um, who was um, suffering quite, quite badly from cancer. And so I went and visited him in the hospital and played didgeridoo on his body. And I certainly had no ability to heal him. But what I had the ability was to tell him that it's okay. That it's okay to go now. Mm -hmm. And like two hours after I visited him and said to his family that you need to say goodbye, you need to, you need to let this man go because it's his time now. Two hours after that session, he, he departed, you know, and made that transition. So, I mean, it's a pretty special position to be put in when people are, are putting, putting their faith into you to give them comfort. Through your website, I know you've spent a lot of time with adolescents, and you encourage the youth to follow in your footsteps. We have a lot of students sitting right here in our studio now, and also a lot of young viewers watching. Do you have any advice for them? Yeah, well, I... I say to people, you know, follow my footsteps, but I don't mean walk in my footprints. No, no. I mean, you know, create your own footprints in this life that we were given, uh, we were given feet to leave a footprint. And so I would always say to, to the young people that the old people, our grandparents, our great grandparents, if they're still there, they are the ones that have the stories of the old ways. So listen to them, spend time to listen to them because they are our living history. And, you know, just even since my time here in Vietnam, just I've taken a couple of photos of some beautiful old people that I've seen on the street because I, in every wrinkle that they have, there has been happiness and there is pain that those people have lived through times that, that we, we as young people, we will never understand how hard that was, but they still have the happiness. And so, you know, never, never shy away from your history because your history is history, but you're here to create future. Talking about your kids, do you want them to kind of follow you and become an artist as well in terms of doing dot painting and playing the didgeridoo? You think you'll teach them? I, I definitely. If they want to learn, I, I will share it with them. I mean, certainly they already express, you know, interest. <laughs> when Dad's sitting out painting, they want to paint as well. And, but, you know, it's, it's their life. I'm not, I'm not there to, you know, to live their life, you know, for them. I'm there to live it with them. Mm -hmm. um, I'm certainly not expecting them to, I definitely don't want them to follow in my footsteps because some of my footsteps were definitely the wrong ones. But definitely if I can lead the way to just giving them an opportunity to have, you know, an amazing life, then that's what I strive to do for my kids. If it's sport, if it's art, if it's dance, if it's music, if it's fashion, I don't mind. As long as, as, long as they're doing something that they love. I don't want them to do something that they're just doing for the sake of doing. I want them to find what truly makes their heart happy mm -hmm. and then do that. Well, thank you very much, Jeremy, for this wonderful talk. But before you go, do you mind giving us another demo? No problem. All right.
Since arriving in Hanoi on Tuesday, I've been very fortunate enough to be able to make exchanges with students uh, from various universities here in Hanoi. Uh, some of the students are here with me today from the, the National University of Arts Education. I was working with them in teaching them one of the traditional dances from my community in far northern Queensland, from the Gokwa Yaranji people. This story, this dance here, is a fun dance. It's a play dance, but it has a serious side because it is about our life out on the land when we go hunting for kangaroos. So in this story, there are two hunters and four kangaroos, and unfortunately, only three will be going home. So my boys from the National University. And this song here is called Ugadangu. Prr, prr, sa'ay, sa'ay, sa'ay. Ugadangu, majaba, Ugadangu, majaba, Ugadangu, majaba, nayangre. Prr, nayangre, prr. O grande Madeba, O grande Madeba, O grande Madeba, Nayangle, Hr, Nayangle, Hr, O grande Madeba, O grande Madeba, O grande Madeba, Nayangle, Hr, Nayangle, Hr, O grande Madeba, O grande Madeba, O grande Madeba, Nayangle, Hr, Nayangle, Hr, Ande la boca na yo pro capole. Ai 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 ai. Cop cop. Ai ai ai. Cop. Thank you very much, Jeremy, and you guys for being such wonderful kangaroos and hunters. And thank you, Jeremy, for being on the show. We wish you all the best of luck in your endeavors. Thank you so much for having me. And that is it for this edition of Top Vietnam. We'll talk again next time. See ya.